So he squeezes that washcloth with everything he's got, and he says, Daddy, I got all the water out. And then I take the washcloth, and I squeeze it, and drain out more water than he's already got in his bowl. Now that's kind of the way it is when you're dealing with a Spurgeon, or an Edwards, or someone else. I'm going to, but I am going to squeeze that rag with all my might. The might in me might be very small. My power to draw from that cloth all the water in it, it may be an impossibility. But I'm going to squeeze it until I get out every drop and then hand it over to Spurgeon. Now, and who, on the other hand, can tell how he descended? To be a man was something, but to be a man of sorrows was far more. To bleed and die and suffer. These were much for him who was the Son of God. But to suffer as he did, such unparalleled agony, to endure as he did, a death of shame and a death of desertion of his God. This is a lower depth of condescending love which the most inspired mind much utterly failed to fathom. And yet must be first and yet must we first understand infinite height and then infinite depth. We must measure in fact the whole infinite that is between heaven and hell before we can understand the love of Jesus Christ. See what his goal is? His goal is to understand the love of Jesus Christ. That's his goal. But he realizes he must do certain things in order to understand that love. What? He must climb to the heights and he must dig down to the depths. So that in that great expanse, he can understand something of the love of Jesus Christ. You must do the same. A lot of preliminary work, gentlemen. A lot of preliminary work. You can't get treasure without digging. You can't see stars without straining the neck. There's one, one thing that Spurgeon says here before we go on I think is very important. If you read any bit of Spurgeon, um, after a while, you begin to realize something. He was a man literally consumed by the cross. Secondly, you'll find that oftentimes in his sermons, he was apologizing. I can't tell you how many times I have read Spurgeon apologizing. Apologizing for what? Saying this. I'm sorry. What I'm going to say today is not going to do justice to the theme. I'm not going to be able to preach this as it ought to be preached. Everything I say will be utter failure. Spurgeon says that very, very often. And I think there's a good lesson here. You get up in a pulpit and think you're going to expound the depths of a truth? If you think that, it's only because you've not gone to the depths. Because once you get to the depths, you realize you're not at the depths at all. You haven't even skimmed the surface. If you were to spend an entirety of 80 years, having already learned Greek and Hebrew and all church history and theologians of the past, if you were to spend 80 years on Psalms 23, you would have not even scratched the surface of that psalm. Does that humble you? It ought to. It ought to. You ought to preach boldly and un unapologetically for the truth that you teach. But at the same time, we have to be apologetic knowing that we can't do justice to this. And just for your sake, even in your glorified state, in heaven, you will not comprehend the fullness of Christ, nor be able to proclaim it. Now let's look at the Son's deity. The Scriptures testify that the one true God exists in a trinity. From the Latin word, trinitas, meaning threefold or three in one, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
There are three distinct persons who are distinguishable from one another and yet share the same divine nature or essence and relate to one another in eternal and unbroken fellowship. Now, this is especially important when we look to the cross and that cry, as Spurgeon said, of Christ's desertion, where he was deserted by God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because we're seeing something happen unique in all of eternity. That this unbroken fellowship is broken. Now, for those of us who drink down iniquity like water, who went astray from the womb, broken fellowship is not that big a deal for a lost man. For a Christian, broken fellowship is a much greater deal. But we cannot even begin to understand what it meant for the one who was absolutely perfect, like God in every way, and who dwelt in unbroken fellowship with Him throughout all eternity, to have that fellowship broken as He bears the guilt of His people. We cannot even begin to understand what that means. But you're supposed to try. Now isn't it amazing that men spend themselves on studying so many silly things instead of sitting down and meditating on the great things. And we hope to encourage and promote God's people by teaching them lists of little rules and principles instead of teaching them things that will build a fire in their heart that will propel them all the way into eternity. How many church growth people would say to their people, we're going to spend the next six weeks simply studying and contemplating the desertion of Christ. That'll do more for the true people of God than all the hokey shenanigans that are usually laid before them in modern Christianity. Now, the Son who became man and died upon the cross is the eternal God, equal to the Father and the Spirit in every way and sharing in their incomprehensible glory. Thomas Boston writes, Hence it is clear that He had a being before He was born of a virgin, yea, from eternity, and that He is the true God and the Most High God, equal with the Father. Again, Boston writes, this gift of God is God. The greatest gift of God is God. The greatest gift you'll receive as you pass over into eternity will be a greater revelation of God. Don't think about mansions. Because it's the Father's mansion in which you're going to live. And the emphasis there is not a mansion. It's you're going to dwell with the Father. They asked a man one time who had suffered many years in prison for the cause of Christ, what was it like to be in that terrible place? I think he was there 13 years. He said it was a 13-year honeymoon with Jesus Christ. You see, the gift of God is God. That's why eternal life, which begins at the moment of conversion, is to know Him. So what is eternal life? What is one of the evidences of having truly been converted? You know Him and desire to know more about Him. Be very careful, men. The greatest enemy to true piety is the ministry. The ministry. And even though you may not go the route of the big time preacher. You need to realize that even the street preacher can fall under what I would call a professionalism. That his relationship with God is all about doing what he does instead of communion with God. Very dangerous. Oh, and don't think it's not going to happen to you. It is going to happen to you. It is. You are a fool to think it won't. 
It's going to happen to you. Beware. I don't know a minister, a true minister of Christ in his older years, who would not say that as he looked back, he saw many times when ministry took the place of God. It's something we must fight on a daily basis. Let me give you an illustration. An evangelist gets off the airplane, is picked up by the pastor and the staff, and um, they understood that the evangelist loved to play golf. So we know, we know we're not talking about me here. I've never played golf. Where I grew up, if you walk around in a field with a stick, the police are going to come get you. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong. I'm not, I'm not, I don't 